The top two in the country in our two states and all in 48 hours. And get ready for more trips as the countdown to Election Day continues. Plus, did President Trump just offer the Kansas governor a job in the White House? What would Jeff Collier do? And for all the politics, was rain, rain and more rain the biggest local story of the week? Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Bob and Marlies Gorley, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, the Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, John H. Mize and Bank of America N.A. co-trustees, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome everyone, I'm Nick Haynes. Glad to have your company on this whirlwind tour of the most important stories making news this week here in our own backyard. Pouring through our local headlines, the head of the Kansas City Star editorial board, Colleen Nelson. And from KCTV 5 News, reporter Caroline Sweeney. From across town at 41 Action News, reporter Stephen Dial. And political analyst, columnist and star editorial writer, Dave Helling. Now, how rare is it for us to get this much national political attention? In less than 48 hours, our bi-state gets visits from the president and the vice president. On Monday, Mike Pence was in Springfield hosting a fundraiser for Josh Hawley, the Missouri Republican, trying to unseat Senator Claire McCaskill. Who I believe will make an outstanding voice for Missouri in the United States Senate. It's all going to come down to the state of Missouri. Because this November, this year, the state of Missouri is going to decide control of the United States Senate. What about Kansas? Two days earlier, President Trump hosting a rally in Topeka for top Kansas Republican candidates, including the man who wants to be the state's next governor, Chris Kobach. Well, let me just say on behalf of all of Kansas, President Trump, welcome to Trump country. He's tough, he's strong, and I hated that he ran because I would have loved to have brought him into my administration. In fact, if he loses, I'll bring him into my administration in two seconds. I hope he loses because I want him so badly, but don't do that. Don't do that. All right, Stephen Dial, I saw you there. Did we learn anything from these two visits on both sides of state line in the last seven days? Well, I think we learned Josh Hawley still is trying to raise money, and he needs the president and the vice president to give him some exposure and keep reminding people that he's on their side. I was in Topeka, the president. I think it was one red hat per every two people uh, in that arena. And, I mean, Chris Kobach, he knows that he's in a three-person race, and he's hoping that Greg Orman doesn't ruin the party for him and make R. Kelly win. Caroline, was there anything in those events that surprised you that you weren't expecting? Surprised me? No. I mean, this is what we've seen from... Um, the president and the vice president over the last several months, they keep coming back here. They know that the Republicans are going to need the support because you're starting to see that national trickle down hit states like Kansas and Missouri and really start shaping our politics. And it's not the end because I happen to see that uh, Mike Pence is going to be coming to Wichita next week to support Chris Kobach. So these visits are going to keep coming before Election Day, Colleen. This is just the warm up and we'll be seeing a lot more of them and particularly in the Missouri Senate race. I mean, every single poll shows a race that's too close to call, a virtual tie. And so Josh Hawley is still introducing himself to voters. He's only been in office for a couple of years. And so uh, he needs uh, the kind of the national profile of, of Trump and Vice President Pence to, to really raise his profile and, and get voters excited about him. At the Topeka event, Dave Helling, President Trump singles out current Kansas Governor Jeff Collier, who was beaten by Kobach in the Republican primary. In front of a huge crowd and a national television audience, President Trump says he'd like Collier to join his administration. Was that just a throwaway comment, or is the president serious about adding Collier to his White House team? Yeah, there's always a, a place in the Trump administration for candidates who have lost, and it's possible that Jeff Collier could find uh, something to do with the administration. Whether he's really that excited about that possibility is not completely clear. But it is very telling, Nick, uh, that the president is coming back uh, to Kansas for Chris Kobach, and then we have this Wichita event. That suggests that race is very close. If the president is spending uh, precious time trying to shore up a candidate like Kobach, that suggests that race is very close. The other thing to keep in mind is uh, Mike Pence in Springfield, the president going down to Springfield, that suggests a bit of a problem for Josh Hawley because that's a very conservative part of the state. 
If the president has to shore up Josh Hawley in Springfield, that means he can't be shoring him up in Kansas City or St. Louis, and so that race is very close as well. Now, also getting the president's attention at the Topeka rally was Steve Watkins. You've probably seen his ads. He's the man battling Democrat Paul Davis to be the next congressman for the 2nd District of Kansas. Get out and vote. I need him in Washington. Steve Watkins. I grew up a couple miles away. And here I am standing next to the leader of the free world. Now, Watkins has been barraged with negative headlines for overinflating his personal and professional experiences. He calls that fake news. But what's appearing on stage with Donald Trump doing to boost his campaign this week, if anything? Well, that's the best thing that's happened to Steve Watkins by far, because he is a political unknown. He came out of nowhere to win the Republican primary. Even Republicans have expressed doubts about him. And the only publicity he's gotten so far is when the Star and others have reported on things he said about his work and life experience that proved to be untrue. And so he is struggling and uh, in, in a district where he, he faces a tough Democratic opponent in, in Paul Davis. And so standing next to the president uh, of the United States gives him legitimacy, and it really is the best thing. Uh, we see these ads all of the time, but some people get confused. This is the district that's basically all of this side of Kansas, with, with the exception of Johnson, Wyandotte, and Miami counties, currently held by Lynn Jenkins, Steve. Well, sitting in, in that arena in Topeka, when, when the president announced him, it was a totally different type of reaction from Chris Kobach or talking about uh, Governor Collier. It was a kind of a who are we clapping for? And it, and it was evident. And I think he needed the president to tr try to give him that boost. I mean, he was walking around the crowd, and some individuals did not know who he was. So I think he's really happy that the he president He actually was mentioned out. President Trump. Almost every single Republican leader, including the attorney general, the Wichita congressman, the western Kansas congressman, no mention, though, of Kevin Yoder at any <laughs> point in time during that long speech. Shocking. Well, yeah, I think Kevin Yoder has made it very clear over the last several months he supports the president, but he doesn't want the president standing next to him in the third district. There is one more thing that happened this week for Steve Watkins, though. He did get an endorsement from Bob Dole. And for Kansas Republicans, that is going to be another thing that adds to the, the, excuse me, the legitimacy that he needs. By the way, I am hosting a debate between the candidates in that second district uh, debate. I'll give you details of that before Election Day when you can see it on KCPT. Yeah, but, just briefly, Nick, you said something very important, which is the shape of the second district has really changed over the years. It used to be basically Topeka when Kansas had five congressional seats, and Democrats were competitive there. You had Jim Slattery, Nancy Boyda won. The second district was in play. Now, because we're just four seats in Kansas, because we've lost population, that district does stretch from border to border, and the southern part of that district is very conservative. It is Trump country. It's very much like Springfield and Joplin, and that should be no surprise since it's right across the border. So I think that race is much closer than a lot of people anticipated, and we'll need to keep an eye on it as election day gets closer. If you've been meaning to vote in this upcoming election and have been thinking to yourself, I really need to register, well, if you live in Missouri, you're now too late. That deadline passed this week, but you still have a few more days in Kansas. The last day to register to vote in Kansas is this upcoming Tuesday. Advanced voting will begin in Kansas just 10 days from now, less if you're watching our Sunday rebroadcast. And according to the Kevin Yoder campaign, up to a hundred Half of all the voters in this district will vote before Election Day. While Yoder and his opponent, Sharice David, still have not found a mutually agreeable time to debate on the same stage. Stephen Dial, you took a different tact, and you invited them both out for breakfast and lunch. What did you learn that may help us better understand these uh, two hard-charging candidates? Well, I learned you can lure politicians with food, right? <laughs> no. um, so Reporters, it, too, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it took some time to, to set this up, and we tried to do it to to get to know the, the human side of them and also ask questions. Of course, I asked Sharice Davis the question that every journalist has wanted to or has asked her about ICE. Her answer was interesting. She said no, and then it kind of went another way. Um, they need to debate, and um, they need to debate. That's but all I can really Interestingly, say. Kevin Yoder picked barbecue. Did they pick the restaurants themselves? Yes, okay, they did. And then where was Sharice Davis? So where that's was that Cafe video? Tempo in uh, Johnson County Community College's yeah. uh, museum. They have a cafe in the middle of it.
Caroline. I just find it really interesting, um, you know, good for Stephen to get Sharice Davids on camera because there have been several events over the last couple of weeks where you would have expected to have seen her make a comment on right. camera, especially after what happened at the Johnson County Bar Association where her campaign openly said, well, when Kevin Yoder decided to come, it's now a debate and we weren't ready for a debate. So it's it's something that I would have expected to have seen her on camera more often considering we're getting so close to this election. Continuing on the news on that Kansas 3rd District seat, a Republican precinct committeeman in Kansas resigns this week after he wrote a social media message saying Sharice David should be sent back to the reservation. Congressman Yoda denounced the message, arguing these kinds of nasty personal attacks need to stop. He releases his own ad that shows no grainy pictures of his opponent or attacks on her policy, but a soft aside his campaign hopes will cut through the noise and leave a lasting impact on voters' minds. Last year, my husband was murdered in a hate crime in Oleta. We had lived here legally for years through my husband's work visa waiting for permanent residency. With my husband gone, I lost my legal status to stay here in America. But Congressman Kevin Yoder heard about my story and fought so I could stay. He's laughed with me, he's cried with me, he's my friend and our congressman. I'm Kevin Yoder and I approve this message. Haven't we always heard that these negative uh, attack ads work? So why is the strategy then from Kevin Yoder to not do any attacks and to present this kind of softer picture of his campaign? Well, it's not as if he's doing no attacks. I mean, he has <laughs> attack ads, too, and, and PACs supporting him have plenty of attack ads. So it's not as if uh, they've backed off of attacking Sharice Davids. But I think this ad points to kind of the treacherous path that Kevin Yoder is trying to walk on the issue of immigration. And this is a really tough issue for him. He, on the one hand, comes out and says he's in favor of the Trump's border wall and will help get funding for it. And then on the other hand, he cuts an ad showing how he's helped um, um, uh, this widow from India retain her visa. And so uh, he's he's had some conflicting messages on immigration. It shows you how tough it's going to be for him to kind of sort that out in this purple district. You spend a lot of time in your life on television, <laughs> truth checking, truth watching yes. campaign ads. But this is a softer ad. There's nothing to truth check on this, is there? Not really. I mean, the endorsement is clear. The typical pattern, Nick, is for candidates to go soft at first, sometimes biographical messages. I was born in a log cabin. You know, I did my homework on the back of a shovel. And then they go highly <laughs> negative, and then they go positive at the end. That's the classic uh, strategy. In this case, you have, and Colleen mentioned this, you have third-party independent expenditures that are doing all the dirty work, or most of the dirty work, not only in this race, by the way, but, but in the second district, too, the Congressional Leadership Fund, run by a guy named Corey Bliss, who ran Pat Roberts' campaign in 2014, they run the highly negative, sleazy strip joint, you know, all those ads, so that Yoder and Watkins, and for that matter, Sharice Davids and Paul Davis, can claim no responsibility. Yeah. So they can claim to be they, clean. That's exactly yeah. what happens. So we've been talking about this the entire election season, especially looking at Kansas. This ad is particularly aimed at those center voters who are trying to decide if they're going to vote for a Republican or a Democrat. If they are standing in the middle between Kevin Yoder and Sharice Davids, this ad is particularly aimed at them. Are there still it's people also, in It's the also aimed, just quickly, at women. And women yeah, voters okay. are a huge problem for uh, uh, Kevin Yoder in the 3rd District. College-educated women, by every poll, are breaking for Democrats across the country by 10, 15, 20 points. That's his biggest hurdle. To have this very sympathetic figure on an ad helps with women voters. I'm sure that's why they're doing it. A quick update on the story that led our program last week when Jason Kander abruptly announced he was dropping out of the Kansas City mayor's race because of depression and PTSD. Now, 11 weeks after exiting the race, Councilwoman Jolie Justice makes it official and announces she's getting back in. We talked a lot about this last week, but is her candidacy diminished because of her in then out then back in decision? Well, I've heard from several people over the last couple of days wondering what this is going to look like when you talk about voter base. So Jolie Justice was in the race. She was one of the front runners, a guy who she knew could probably beat her and outraise her when you're talking about campaign money comes in. She looks at him and says, well, maybe this isn't the right time for me and steps back now wants to get back in because Jason Kander is out, her, you know, her main opponent is out. 
I don't know if that's going to play well with voters. Now, we are still several months away, and we haven't really turned that corner yet when you're looking at how important campaign funds are going to be. But I think this is going to be a detriment early on. I think it can be a talking point for a week or two, but I think eventually we were talking. Voters really are just focused on the midterm. I think a lot of people aren't even thinking about this uh, April primary. And I know Dave Fellings is going to say it's too early to exalt her as the <laughs> presumptive nominee. And so I, I think it could be a talking point early on, but after that, I don't think it's really going to hurt her. But and you I can't imagine attack ads, uh, Colleen saying, oh, she's so indecisive. She was in, and then she was out, then she's back in again. I, I don't think this is going to help her, but it's not going to sink her candidacy. But, I mean, she lost some time. She lost some fundraising. And I've talked to some, some donors who had been on Team Jolie and then had been cut loose by the fact that she dropped out. And they've since pledged themselves to other candidates. And so the question is, is she going to get all of her key donors and supporters back? Um, she has a steep hill to climb. It's, it's a, a crowded field. And even though she's very competent and will be a strong candidate, She's not exactly a, a household name to, to folks who don't spend time at City Hall. Could, could and Steve, uh, are you going to um, make Stephen's prediction true <laughs> and say <laughs> it's too early to anoint her? It's too early to anoint nominee. her as anything. <laughs> okay, right. But she has helped Nick, uh, as all the candidates are, by this unusually large and balanced field. This is an important point, I think. The fact is that when you have eight or nine equally qualified candidates, more or less, it isn't going to take that many votes to win the primary or at least be one of the top two finishers. And so I'm, I'm sure Jolie Justice is thinking, well, sh you know, I only need 10,000 votes maybe. Uh, I can certainly get those somehow. It is a wide open race because it's so balanced. You don't have, it's not a top tier and a bottom tier. They're all on the same tier. When that happens and you get 50 or 60,000 votes, it doesn't take that much to prevail. Steve, and just really quickly, I won't name names, but I reached out to a couple of her now opponents again, and they weren't phased. I said, what are your thoughts? And they were like, Oh, she's announcing? So, I mean, I don't know if that's strategy, if that's just blowing it off, but I don't think it really yeah. made a difference right. for them. And as Stephen pointed out earlier, the primary election is still six months from now in April. A more immediate decision we'll be making at the ballot box is who should uh, sit in one of the Missouri's two United States Senate seats this Thursday night. Join KCPT and our sister station in St. Louis for the Missouri Senate debate. Judy Woodruff from the PBS NewsHour flying in to moderate that exchange. You can see it live on KCPT Thursday at 7. Now, the biggest conversation topic in Kansas City this week was likely not politics and not even the extraordinary record of the Kansas City Chiefs, however remarkable that has been. How about rain and lots and lots and lots of it? You come to live with some water. Um, but when you get seven, eight inches of rain in 48 hours. Flooding reported all around our metro with lots of events canceled, roads closed and even some remarkable water rescues, including 20 students on this school bus caught in floodwaters south of Swope Park. Some areas of the southern parts of our metro have seen over a foot of rain, according to the National Weather Service, and more rain is coming. Have we learned any lessons from this latest weather emergency in Kansas City? Caroline. Well, I can speak personally that I think we, uh, because I had a lake in my parking lot for several days, I think the city needs to take a look at where this water is going to go. I know we had some issues with storm drains around my apartment complex. Um, I just live um, in the south part of the plaza. So I think people need to really be prepared for this late, you know, early fall rain when it's going to come in. Um, and the city needs to start looking at, at things it can do because this standing water is going to cause problems. Let's talk about that because we get lots of questions here at KCPT, even though we're not a weather station, all about the weather. Some, though, like KCPT viewer Ray asking what happened to all the money Kansas City has brought in in special taxes for flood control, Dave. Well, uh, there is some. there was some flood control money in the bond package that passed in 2017, but it takes some time for that money, all of it, to be spent. And, in fact, it was anticipated that a lot of that money would be spent over time to solve some of these problems. But we should be absolutely clear, Nick, the flooding problems in Kansas City, while still with us, are much less severe than they were at one time. And I know that because I've reported in this town since the mid-1980s. I was 
in the streets in 1998 when 10 people were killed on a flood at the Prospect Bridge. I was doing live shots all night. That was a Sunday. They canceled the Chiefs game. That was a horrific problem along Turkey Creek. Turkey Creek, of course, took dozens of lives in 1977 when it flooded. The Blue River used to flood all the time. It doesn't anymore because of enormous spending to clear out that channel. Turkey Creek used to flood Southwest Boulevard when it looked like rain and caused millions of dollars of damage. I covered that story uh, for years, 1993, the Great Flood. So we, we have made enormous strides to make this a less flood-prone community. However, you still have problems on Indian Creek. You still have problems in backyards. Some places north of the river flood. That's why that money is there. If there's some patience, I think those problems will be addressed as well. Now, sometimes timing is everything. This week, a water-damaged Waldo Library branch became the backdrop for a campaign event for the library tax, which Kansas City voters will decide in November as library employees cleaned up damage in the children's books area. Library director Crosby Kemper joined civic leaders in promoting the eight-cent increase in the property tax levy to support Kansas City public libraries. Needless to say, the world has changed, particularly the technological world has changed a huge amount, and uh, our revenues essentially have been capped since about 2007. Okay, we get it. People love libraries, but where would this money actually go, though, Colleen? Well, the money would go to upgrading some of the libraries, like Waldo Library, which you which you saw, which does have flooding issues. It would upgrade the Northeast Branch Library and um, also help make some technology upgrades and, and also just help the library keep up with some funding decline that they've seen over the years. And at this point, uh, there's no organized opposition to this, but it is another tax increase. And so, you know, the question for voters becomes how many times are we willing to raise our own taxes? Kansas City voters voted last year for the GEO bond package, which is a tax increase. They voted to raise the sales tax for the east side improvements. And uh, and Kansas City voters have seemed pretty willing to raise their own taxes, but is there a limit? To so that? some people may be concerned this is one tax too many, Caroline? Some people may be concerned about that, but the library hasn't asked for anything like this in more than 20 years. And when we're looking at tax increases for projects, big projects like we always talk about, you know, on this show, like hotels and the streetcar and go bond projects, something to help a community based organization like the library, because that's what these libraries are now. They're increasing their footprints. It's not just books and CDs and computers, it's community based events. I think. Uh, the first ask in tw more than 20 years is more than appropriate. Dave. Yeah, there's a couple of things. I did a little research for a story I'm working on. Not for Since, this show, uh, just for the story you were working <laughs> on. For, okay. for my employer, All right. uh, <laughs> the Kansas City Star. Since 2012, Kansas Cityans have approved 10 different tax increases or tax extensions uh, for their community. The earnings tax, the combat tax, the go bonds, the eight cent on the east side. I mean, you just go down the list, not to mention the streetcar districts, all since 2012, that's six years. There, and every time you hear the same argument, which is, oh, this is just $10 for a house that's worth or whatever the number is. But those tax increases do add up, and there is some growing resistance to the idea that this is an inexhaustible way to provide money for public services, which is why the pre-K tax struggled so much earlier this year. People were just saying, you know, at some point enough is enough. We're not even counting, you know, community, improve, uh, com community improvement districts, other things. So there is some sense that there may be a limit coming soon where Kansas City and say no more. It's not clear the library is there, but that may be a place. The headline in the star was dramatic. UMKC to drop sponsorship of eight charter schools, including University Academy. UMKC is getting out of the sponsorship business. I was expecting to read horror stories from parents, staff, and principals about how they may be forced to close the doors. But the head of the Missouri Charter Public School Association says the decision will have zero impact on the schools, parents, and students. Now, a number of KCPT viewers seem confused, including Janice, who asks, if it has zero impact, what's the point of these charter school sponsors? Aren't they supposed to be holding the schools accountable, making sure money is spent properly, academic standards are maintained or even improved? Who can answer that question? 
Colleen? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it, I think the headline, it certainly was dramatic. And so I think some people saw that and said, well, gosh, are these charter schools going to shut down? And the answer is no, they're not going to shut down. Uh, a sponsor does hold the school accountable in terms of compliance and reaching academic standards. But these schools can get another sponsor. And so they can go to the, the charter commission for one as a sponsor, or they have some other options. And so if you think, oh, gosh, these eight schools are going away, that's not happening. But this, this does signal something interesting that UMKC is deciding to move in a different direction. We also heard from several viewers who felt last week's show wasn't complete because we didn't mention the opening of High V Arena. Thank you, Eric, Josh, and Chris, for your emails. Kemper Arena is no more. It is now High V Arena. If we can rebuild this arena, I think we can rebuild some lives. The two-story youth sports mecca, and yes, after a mammoth renovation, it opened at the very end of last week. What type of reviews is Kansas City's newest arena getting, Caroline? Well, I was down outside the old Kemper Arena, the new hy -Vee Arena, last week because of the American Rail Rodeo, and everyone there seemed very excited about what was coming, and I think everyone's talking about pickleball. I haven't had a chance to play pickleball yet, <laughs> but I think something as simple as, as that is really going to draw people in to um, an area of the city that is slowly kind of making its way back into prominence, especially with the growing younger population. Um, but Kansas City has been needing something like this in the city center for a very long time. It was costing a million dollars a year to keep Kemper Arena open, and the city sold uh, mm. the facility to Fouch Brothers, the developer, for one dollar. And I loved in the ceremony, Dave Helling, that uh, Troy Schulte, the city manager, gives back <laughs> the dollar to Fouch Brothers during that ceremony. Yeah, a, a million dollars to, to keep it, you know, heated and lit. Uh, you know, it wasn't really open. There wa weren't any activities in it. The West Bottoms is changing dramatically, Nick, from 20 or 30 years ago. And by the way, flooding problems used yeah. to be predominant there as well. But you, you know, it used to be the stockyards, and it used to be warehouses, and now you're getting arts installations, and, and, and li people are living there, and younger people are coming to Kemper, and the, the whole idea of the American Royal is moving. It's a fascinating thing to see that historic part of Kansas City really transform itself, and this will be a good part of that. And that is our Week in Review. Our thanks to our news reviewers leading the editorial board of your Kansas City star, Colleen Nelson, and Stephen Dial from 41 Action News, from KCTV5 reporter Caroline Sweeney, and from the pages of your Kansas City star, Dave Helling. I'm Nick Haynes. From all of us here at KCPT, thanks for spending part of your weekend with us.